Hello and welcome to episode 172 of Page One, the Writer's Podcast. I'm Tarek. I'm Marco and thanks for joining us on the podcast where we like to speak to writers of all kinds about their writing careers, find out how they got into the industry and try and get as many hints and tips from them as possible. Uh, and as I always say, we've got a great back catalogue of guests there, so please do check that out if you haven't already. But this week, uh, in a rare occurrence, we have a returning guest. We do indeed. We're seeing the return of Lorne Hippucus, who has uh, written the incredible Shining Girls, um, which she chatted to us about last time she was on the podcast. And this time we are chatting about her newest book, um, Bridge, which is out just last week in the UK and is already out uh, in the US. And we really cover, although she's been on before, we don't go through exactly the same old how did you get into the industry, etc. Check out the last episode she was on for that yes. part of it. But we really cover a whole bunch of different stuff with her, you know, speculative thrillers, genre crossing books, where they sit in the market, uh, the literary scene in South Africa, the Shining Girls TV show, all that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and we, Bridge, her new book, uh, deals with the question of the multiverse. And we have a bit of a chat about, you know, stories in the past few years. There's been a big focus, whether it's in cinema or books, uh, on this idea of a multiverse. And we chat to her a bit about why that might be and how she approaches it as well and but we did start off uh, asking her about the shining girls tv show so we'll get straight into it and then we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat and to let you know about next week's guest but for now on with the podcast the blank page to some it's terrifying an obstacle to overcome but we prefer to think of it as an opportunity a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head so how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made Page One. Page One is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story, so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realised you need to plan how to let people read it, so we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, a screenplay, a comic or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. What have you been up to since you were last on the on the podcast, R writing Bridge, but also uh, since we last spoke, um, we had mentioned the Shining Girls TV sh series was in production, I think, at that point, and now it's come out. So what were your thoughts on it when, when you actually got to see it and everything? Well, yeah, there's a TV show that's come out based on my book. I've moved whole countries. Um, I've got a new book out. It's been quite a quite a time, survived a <laughs> pandemic. Um <laughs> The Shining Girls TV show was so great and it's so cool because I don't have to self-deprecate about it because I had no involvement and it was just incredibly smart, um, a beautiful nuanced kind of exploration of PTSD and trauma and how dissociative that can be. Um, and they find out that there's a time traveling serial killer and that she's not, you know, just imagining this. And um, yeah, there, there are lines of dialogue I wish I'd written. I thought the character of Dan was actually better than the one I wrote. I was a little bit resentful and mad about that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and like just uh, Elizabeth Moss was incredible. Jamie Bell was like the perfect incel serial killer. Um, 
and it had the same bloody heart and guts as the book, um, which I just love. I mean, I couldn't have asked for like a better adaptation. Were there scenes in it? I always wonder this when when authors see their own work on screen. Were there scenes that like matched almost exactly what you had in your head when you were when you were writing it? What was really interesting was I'd taken some photographs when I went on my research trips to Chicago. And the location of the house in particular, I was like, oh, I've been there. I took that photograph and it felt like they'd, I don't know if it was exactly the same place, but it was so familiar. I was like, they've really nailed it. So it was great. Uh, it was really interesting though, because I couldn't read the scripts uh, when they were sending them to me because the time travel in the Shining Girls TV show is much more multiverse, which in the book, it's a closed loop. Um, you know, what has been will be. Um and I know of course writing a multiverse novel and I was like, oh, I just want to be unduly influenced by what they're doing. Um, so it was really okay. interesting to like, you know, get a first draft of the novel done and then be able to watch the TV show. The timing was impeccable. Well, that's what I wanted to ask was, was how did you feel when you sat down to actually watch the show? You know, were you, were you, because it's, it must be a nervousness about handing over your baby to other people to do their version of and, you know, you, you, you were you scared that they would do a bad job? What were you thinking when you sat down to watch that first episode? I mean, luckily I'd read the script, so I knew it was good. Um, but of course, you know, things can go wrong between a really good script and like an actual TV show. But um, I think it was just, it was really exciting and nerve wracking. And But it was also, you know, this was a different animal. This wasn't my book. This was something else. And I actually, I love collaboration when I'm working with someone who's smarter than I am in a different field. Uh, you know, whether that's writing comics and like you have an artist who just draws things away you couldn't have imagined. And to have this kind of adaptation come out, which was so different to the book, so resonant with it, um, was just really exciting. I did watch it with my then 13-year-old daughter, which is not appropriate watching for a 13-year-old, just so you know. <laughs> um, but it was so interesting because when she, when I wrote the book, the way I dealt with Harper writing Harper the Serial Killer was by just hurting him at every opportunity. Um, you know, if there was a chance to fuck him up, I would fuck him up. And when my daughter was watching the show, she would she was doing this fan art of him just getting like wounded and of course he still gets injured a lot which is great right. but it was her favorite thing was just drawing him like getting messed up whenever she could and i just felt this incredible <laughs> moment like mother daughter bonding and how much we loathe <laughs> this character and wanted to hurt him <laughs> had she read the book as well no she hasn't she barely reads and she definitely doesn't read my stuff so okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the mom I'm not very cool <laughs> Um, well, I mean, to to link it to to the new book Bridge, which um, we'll, we'll discuss in detail in a moment. But um, obviously, as you said, the the TV show version of the Shining Girls sort of treated the the jumps in a sort of multiversal way, um, and your new novel Bridge uh, has a multiverse element in it as well. Do you, do you want to just tell us a bit about the book first of all? Sure. Um, so the book is about a young woman who is reeling in the wake of her mother's death from brain cancer. Um, and it's pulled up all these old memories of like these weird games that they used to play where they would go to other worlds. But obviously that was part of her mom's delusion. But then she finds this artifact in her mom's things. And it's the dream worm that her mom and her used to use when she was a kid. And it turns out it does let you access other realities. And, you know, and maybe her mom said some very strange things on her deathbed about like, you're not my daughter and I just want to go home. And maybe, maybe that had a much deeper meaning. So she's trying to solve this mystery of like what actually happened to her mother. Um, and she's going through all the old journals, but of course there's also someone else who is also after the dream worm and they're incredibly dangerous and they really, really don't want people to be like doing these kind of alternate reality body switches um, for very good reason. It turns out if, if you feel like they're quite sympathetic to them. But um, yeah, so like very sinister, psychedelic, psychological, high concept thriller um, kind of thing. <laughs> nice. Sounds amazing. Thanks. Uh, and and obviously the concept of, of the multiverse or alternate reality, but particularly multiverse, if we take that um, expression, is it's been very in now for for a few years um, yeah w w why do you think that is what does it is it just the opportunity that it gives to a, a writer to to explore lots of different things that, that that perhaps other stories don't i think for me what i was interested in was this idea of all these other lives we might have missed out on you know and i think that's something we can really relate to you know i wish i'd gone to university um, I could have pursued a career in journalism. I could have been a detective. I think I would have been a terrible detective because I would have found it too upsetting. But, um, 
I think I think that we all like think about the things that we've lost or the opportunities that we've missed or the bad situations we stuck around in for far too long. And I feel like that's really something core to the human experience. But also we already live. And I think maybe this is what explains the popularity. I mean, partly it's that you get to go really psychedelic and big and like change everything. And, you know, um, what if a spider pig um, or sausage fingers? And, that, and that's amazing. That's really exciting. But I think we, I was interested in a much more mundane kind of real life equivalent and compatibility. Um, and I think partly that's because we already live in alternate realities, you know, whether that is socioeconomic or geographical, where the UK and the US had access to vaccines. And in South Africa, the first time we got vaccines was in July 2021, you know, um, or whether that is the reality of someone who is a diehard Trump supporter or believes that like refugees and asylum seekers should be crammed into a 250 person barge and basically kept in a floating prison with no recreational facilities. And that's okay. And that is the right way to treat people who are fleeing their countries. We, we already have this complete schism in how we experience the world. And I think that is becoming more and more divided. And I think that is something that I was really thinking about is that we already live in alternate realities. They just happen to be layered on top of each other. And, and I suppose even sort of taking that idea further, individuals as well can almost have that different these alternate realities where they have their mundane home life or, or, or work life or whatever and then you know they can create almost an entirely different persona online Absolutely. and go in and live on there have friends that they'll never meet but have a different personality and all that sort of thing so you can you i suppose now a days you can almost live these different different realities at the same time Absolutely. And like be a different person in that. And of course, even just like code switching in normal life, you know, mm. I might swear on your podcast, but I'm not going to swear in front of, you know, someone's granny, um, unless they were a very cool granny and they swore first. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think there is that, that aspect. And I think there is, you know, something I was uh, interested in with, with my previous book, Broken Monsters, is who we are online and how mm. that changes. Um, uh, you know, when you, when you initially started talking about this, I thought maybe you'd figured out my secret that I'm actually like have a drag king persona. I wish I had a drag king persona. I'm not, I'm not that cool. <laughs> how do you, when you're writing a multiversal story, how do you make sure that you keep the the kind of consequences in check? You know, because when you've got these infinite potential, infinite versions of a character and if someone dies, how do you make it so someone else can just pop into their place? You know, how do you make, uh, how do you give the gravitas and the and the and the the risk to a story where you've got infinite versions of characters? You mean unlike the Marvel movies, um, <laughs> where there are zero stakes and people just come back the next episode? Hang on, hang on. Uh, Spider Verse is one of the <laughs> oh, best. Oh no, not Spider Verse, not right, Spider Verse. Okay, okay, I thought you were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fine. Okay, I'll, no, I'll that doesn't even count as a Marvel movie. Are you kidding? Um, <laughs> Uh, and everything everywhere all at once is already the perfect mother daughter multiverse story. But if you like that, you might also like my book. Um, but I think so. But I think that is that that is an important distinction is that I kept it mundane. Um, so it's first of all, it's like a quantum leap style body switch. It's or like a Freaky Friday body swap. So you know, um, you might uh, Tarek, you might swap between like the other version of yourself, and maybe mm -hmm. he. I don't know, is a oil rigger diver and he's down in the deep in the dark and like facing, you know, and like getting paid hundreds of thousands of pounds um, and has this amazing flashy life. But like when you switch with him, you're in the deep in the dark uh, mm -hmm. and maybe you don't know how to use the equipment and it's, you know, and so there are a lot of mistakes there. Actually, that's Ooh, a great man. idea. Why didn't I put that in the book? <laughs> um, <laughs> or I don't know, like maybe, maybe you're like international F1 driver. I don't, I don't know what you're into. Uh, I'm, loving, or... I'm loving your versions of you so far. These are, these are <laughs> killer. This is great. <laughs> but also, you know, like, if you get a glimpse of these other lives that you could have had, like, what is that going to do to you? And some of them, you know, might be like complete losers or, you know, you know, somebody who's really struggling with drug addiction, for example, um, or someone who's just like can't get off the couch. Um, and, and it's kind of reconciling all these might have beens. And I think that's kind of where I wanted to keep it. I really wanted to keep it very real and very textured. And, and so the way it plays out in this universe is you can't really move into other universes unless they're compatible in some way, which means you can't kind of have the, I don't know, weird, fractured, kind of fractal, eldritch horror monster version of yourself. Okay. And, and... Although that would be cool. <laughs> and I would like to meet that version of myself. And, and and looking at the the writing side of, of a story like this, I mean, how how did you go about that? Was it was it something that you had to plan out in terms of like the different the different versions and all of this sort of thing? 
you know, and like the characters actually have at one point, they almost have kind of a murder board going. Uh, Bridge and her best friend Dom, who's a non-binary Puerto Rican um, graphic designer and artist. And uh, yeah, and I kind of had exactly the same thing. So I had the whole plot up on the wall. I had like different colored cards for the different characters, but then also for the different main universes that we visit. Um, and there are actually, I think, only like four that are like really central to the plot. Um, so I didn't have to keep track of thousands. Um, I just had to keep track of like what was happening in each of those and what the experience had been. And I think the shiny girls already, you know, I already had a motor wall for that. Like the pictures of that are up online. And uh, yeah, I think maybe next time I'm just going to do something really simple. I might do like a rom-com that's just <laughs> set in our world and it's just really easy. Uh, no, I'm never going to do that. Why am I kidding? But <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I mean, this is your, I think this is your seventh fiction book. And it's my sixth novel. Sixth novel. Okay. Because you've written yeah. nonfiction books, you've written comics, obviously scripts. Yep. You know, I mean, it, does writing get any easier the more you do? No. Or is it? No. Okay. <laughs> so no. Hoping the answer was going to be yes. But... No, I'm sorry. It gets worse. Like, <laughs> I think like, you know, I think there's more, there's more pressure. You're even more aware of the things that you don't know. Um, I will say that I'm hopeful with my writing going forward in that I got an ADHD diagnosis in December okay. and that has been life-changing in terms of being able to, a big part of ADHD is like um, not being able to start things, which I, you know, I think most people relate to and I think most writers, especially like you're staring at the page, but I'd, I'd want to write and I'd need to write. I had a deadline breathing down my neck and I, I just couldn't do it. And it was, it was physically impossible. Um, and since I've been on medication, I think that process has become a lot easier. It's got to do with dopamine and um, right, uh, kind of motivation. Yeah, so it's really interesting. So that has been a life-changing thing for me. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. Uh, but also, I think the book kind of speaks. I know everything everywhere all, all at once. One of the Daniels is talking about how it's an ADHD metaphor, and I'm like, all right, I kind of did the same thing without knowing I had ADHD. <laughs> um, it's funny, as a total layman with no knowledge of how ADHD works I would have almost thought it would be the opposite in that case you would have been too, too many ideas and too too much ex ex oh, oh, did hyper. you not notice them all in the page <laughs> <laughs> And but is there just going back to Tarek's question I suppose of the you know you, you're an experienced writer now you've got a lot of a track record there is there when you're writing something that is as layered as this you know yeah. with these different ideas do you at least have the the confidence that you know you know in those difficult moments which i'm sure you had when you were writing yeah. it do you have the confidence that you can get to the end of it because you've done it before or was it easier in the past when you sort of were naive and thought well I, i'll just keep going and this will this will get to the end I think I've always struggled to write it. You know, I love it. And when I get into flow, it's amazing. Um, I love having written. Um, the actual process of writing, I find very difficult. And um, it's kind of very, very in your head work. I think the writer Jason Arnop has a great analogy. He says, writing isn't hard like being a firefighter is hard. Writing is hard like being on fire. Um, and I really love that. I think that mm -hmm. it is you're just, you're just in kind of like the deep conceptual waters of your head and like trying to figure stuff out and trying to like make things work and fit together um but I also love being out there it's this kind of subconscious magic where suddenly as you're writing something will change and the character will be saying a line of dialogue you had intended and it's not that you're possessed or that they're alive it's that brains are magic and this is where you know the big uh, language learning models and like the you know plagiarism engines of AI I don't think they'll compete because I don't think they'll be able to make those weird connections, um, you know, of, of the human consciousness where you're you're bringing in everything that you've experienced and lived and like breathed and read and seen, um, and and of course we're also like all remixing all those influences, but also through the lens of like the actual physical embodied human experience. Mm -hmm. uh, it's getting very philosophical. Um, yeah, I, I, I have completely forgotten the question. <laughs> Well, it, it was it was more, about, yeah. It, I mean, it, that's a good answer, but it was it was about the <laughs> sort of having the confidence, you know, oh, knowing sure. that you know that knowing that you can reach reach the end of of what can be quite complicated stories to pull together. I have the evidence on my on my you know on my bookshelf. Like here are other books that I've written, and yeah. I actually managed to pull that off. Um, so I must be able to do it. It must be physically possible. Um, but I'm very lucky in that I have like an incredible support network. Um, my best friend Sam Beck Bessinger is an amazing writer. With this book, my friend Dr. Haley Tomes uh, is a neuroparasitologist, and she 
read the book, but also taught me all about neuroparasites and, um, and, and we sit and we talk about plot stuff together. So I have people I can bounce stuff off. Mm. Um, and then I also work with a development editor, Helen Moffat, who's been with me since Moxie Land, my first novel. And she is just like, she understands story in such a really complicated, brilliant way. And she really understands who I am and what I'm trying to do. And she'll really push me to that in a way that other people don't. Um, part of the problem is she's had long COVID basically since March, 2020. Oh, no. And I was really lucky when the final edits of this book came up that she was actually in a window period where she was able to work, but it was just, it's been so debilitating for her. And it's just so devastating to see someone who's got just this brilliant mind. who's this incredible shepherd of like specifically South African writers and specifically black South African writers and to get them out of the world and to shape their stories and how devastated she's been by this. I was going to ask, you know, you, the work that you do, you clearly write writing these kind of speculative thrillers, kind of genre crossing stuff. And, 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 and it sounds like you've got people that you can talk to, that you bounce ideas off, that you, that you kind of work out the path through the story, because, you know, how do you keep something like this grounded and not lose readers? Because it's a balance, right? You want to have your kind of time travel element, but you've also got your character who's a serial killer, who's the young girl. And this, so you're kind of juggling those two really different ideas in the same work how does how do you manage that without one or either side of it taking over i know i mean it's difficult and with bridge it was even more complicated than the shining girls because you know i've got it's multi-characters so we have things from the, the antagonist perspective amber um we have bridge we have multiple versions of bridge that are crossing backwards and forwards between the realities we have uh, her best friend dom who's this just incredibly warm effusive person who's also had quite a troubled past and um, is, is trying to like protect her and make sure that everything's okay. Um, but also has a lot of like questions about the moral complexity of this. And then you have Joe's diaries, her mom. So you know, there are already like four major voices and then the, the other iterations of bridge. Um, and then kind of trying to keep track of the universes. And then I also switch between persons. So it's like, it's most of the novel is told in third person. Joe's diaries are in first person. And there's some sections where Bridge is doing these jumps between realities where I wanted to try and get at some of that disassociativeness and it's actually written in second person. Um, and I was, I was, I was just waiting for my publisher to come back and be like, absolutely not. But they're like, no, I love it. It really works. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how I pull it off. I think it just, it's just gut instinct and kind of forcing my way through. And then also having really great editors and, and people in my court who like, you know, like, oh my God, this is not working. You need to fix this. Or, hey, I, I don't know how you did that, but you actually pulled it off. And and when you're switching between sort of uh, POVs and 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 uh, perspectives like that, is it is it easy for you to do? You know, to jump from one to the other to the other, or do you sometimes are you sometimes tempted to say, well, I'm going to continue this aspect of the story because I'm in the flow, or do you just write it in a very linear way and just jump as you're going? I write in a linear way, but I also use Scribner, which allows you to move chapters right. around okay. yeah. just by clicking and dragging. And also my favorite feature on Scribner, which I think has saved me so much self-doubt um, and paralysis is uh, the snapshot feature where you can take a snapshot of the yeah. chapter and you can have 400 snapshots because you've changed the word. You're like, oh, actually, maybe this would work in uh, you know, present tense rather than past tense. Or let's take out the cathedral scene. Um, and they're like, oh, no, no, I want the cathedral scene back in. Um, and that That's has been feature. like life saving. I've never tried that. I never. I love that program, but I've never. It is the best feature because oh. previously, when I wrote in Word, I would have like four million drafts. Yeah. Because you know, I'd be like, oh, I think I'm going to change this character's motivation, and then I'd have to go back five drafts to try and find in the manuscript where it was. So it's it's my absolute favorite feature because it also allows me the confidence to carry on because I know it's still there if I need to go back. Yeah. And you know how many times I go back? Zero. Yeah. Uh -huh. Zero. But it's, you're right because I, I i do use the snapshot snapshot feature as well and it does it just gives you that confidence that y even though you probably know that you're doing the right thing and changing it you've got the yeah. security blanket of having That's it there cool. if you need to okay. if you need to revert back to it in some way yeah like i, I only do high act trapeze with a safety net <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and, and obviously you have you seen a you know you as Tarek says you you write these um sort of speculative thriller genre crossing books that from speaking with other authors on the podcast you know we're always hearing from publishing industry oh the cross genre is a difficult sell they want you to you know they they, they, lo they love to be able to categorize you and put you in one place in the bookshop on the bookshelf 
have you seen a sort of change in attitude at all in terms of more openness to this or is it just still quite difficult if you're writing this type of story I think it's quite difficult. I was at uh, the Brookline book, uh, Bookstore in Boston. Oh, there's a lot of bees. Brookline Bookstore in Boston. And I was chatting with the owner and he was like, where do people normally shelve you? Because I, I normally put you in thrillers, but I'm never sure. I'm like, I, I don't know. I think I'm one of the great unshelvables. Um, and I think I think there are a lot of people like that. And I do think I do find the marketing reductive the same way being a woman writer is reductive um, or a you know South African writer is reductive. Um, but I also understand that we need to market things and people need to reach, people need to be able to find things on the shelves. Um, but I don't think that attitude is changing. I think, you know, I think I would have a very different career in one of my alternate lives if I just stuck to serial killer fiction and just gone hard in that yeah. route. Uh -huh. um, and, and maybe had the same detective and like followed the adventures of Gabby Posado through supernatural Scooby-Doo mysteries for the rest of her life and the rest of mine. Um, but I'm, I'm not really interested in that. Uh, and partly that's ADHD where like I'm interested in the new shiny thing and then fall into a deep dive on that. Um, but partly it's also just, I just, I would, yeah, I would just get really bored. I want to, I want to keep challenging myself. I want to tell stories that, that I hope are surprising. I, I, I mean, I do find it's a discussion we've had with, with a few of our guests and I always find it quite a frustrating discussion because to me, there seem and this I suppose I'm only speaking from my own perspective in terms of the types of books that I read and stuff but it does seem to me that there is a massive audience for books that aren't aren't as easily you know aren't a police procedural book aren't, aren't a serial killer book every week every yep. you know version um but it, they're still the, the, and I suppose it's true of any aspect of the publishing industry but it, it seems to be very slow to change that attitude that no no you have to carry this book has to be mar marketed as this I mean I think we had was it um, James Oswald we had on Tarek who, mm -hmm. who yeah. writes um, crime books but they have a supernatural element but apparently yeah. when they're marketed uh, you know from reading the back of the book you wouldn't really know that there's the supernatural element to which them is because... kind of mental because yeah people would get through it and be like what the hell is fucking ghost yeah, exactly. going on here <laughs> yeah, exactly so it, yeah it, it's I, I don't know it, it maybe it's a result of the sort of books that i read and the sort of authors that i've spoken to and stuff but it seems to me that there is a much wider appetite for this sort of thing and yet if you look online, if you speak to people in the publishing industry, there still is this very, as you say, reductive approach to, no, it has to go in this category. You have to be boxed in a very small category. And if you're going to cross genre, well, that's a big risk, you know. But... I mean, I think it is a risk, but I think I, I don't know how to write any other kinds of books. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you know, I, I but exactly heard what you were saying about... Um, you know, Broken Monsters was kind of marketed in the UK as kind of a straight thriller. Mm. And and I think some people got really mad because they bought it at the airport bookstore and then <laughs> they were like, what the hell is this supernatural <laughs> nonsense? And why why is this kid's teeth falling out? I'm like, oh, the kid's teeth are falling out because it's a dream. And like, that's what happens in dreams. Um, so, yeah, um, it's, yeah, it, it is. I think it is frustrating. I, but I, I don't think it does the audience a good service either. I don't think audience yeah, exactly. I don't think they yeah. want to be surprised. Like they're in for like a cool police procedural, and then suddenly like there's monsters. Like I didn't sign up for that. Yeah, no, no. And if and if you want a, I mean, there's a massive market for people, as Marco says, for people who want books that are kind of like a normal book but with a twist. So maybe there's a AI yeah, totally. element or there's a cyberpunk element or something, but it's that kind of you know old familiar feel with a new twist but it's and so it market it as that and let people know that it is that yeah, yeah totally. exactly it's interesting because i think a lot of like literary and lit let's be clear literary is a own genre mm -hmm. a lot of literary authors get to like write in kind of science fiction or horror or yes. you know wherever yeah, very much so. and but they then don't get shelved in that section you know mm -hmm. um and I th i'm thinking about like you know margaret atwood and Katsura Shiguro, yep. uh david yep. mitchell uh yep. emily st john mandel like they're in the mainstream they're on the front table um and it's just I I don't know we just have this very weird idea of what genre is and what and who's allowed to write to write yes. what yeah yeah that's right. yeah like I wonder how do they how do they market someone like Emily St John Mandel then do they market her as I mean just a book just literature just a book yeah there's exactly yeah, 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 right. there's not like it's, it's not like in the 
crime shelf or the sci-fi shelf. It's just yeah, it's a it's weird. I don't. It's a very strange beast market. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's it like in South Africa then? You know, in terms of the the literary scene. You know, is it is it uh has it changed a lot in your experience since you've been writing? What kind of um, what kind of stuff does well there? And what you know what what's the what's it like? Well, there has been an explosion of genre writing, which has been really exciting to see. Um, and there have been a bunch of white writers like Charlie Human and Sam Wilson who have been writing like really interesting, fun stuff. But then also like just a, a really strong rise of like really amazing black writers, including Masanda and Shanga, who wrote uh, The Reactive, um, Tanya Jurgens, who's got a fantasy novel out, uh, Dreamer, which I've yet to read, but it sounds amazing. Uh, young white queer writer, Alistair McKay, has written an amazing climate change novel. And so it just feels like there's a lot more space for people to tell those stories. The problem is in South Africa is that if you sell a thousand copies, you're a bestseller. Mm -hmm. And even more so than in the UK, like it's it's almost impossible to make a living from being a novelist. Um, you know, like most of the people I know who are full-time novelists generally have either made it in another country, um, as I have in the US and the UK, or, you know, they have a, a spouse um, or a trust fund or something. Uh, and that allows them to kind of just do this full time on the side because someone else is paying the mortgage and the cat food and, you know, all the rest of it. So, um, so why is that? Is that because it's just not a lot of readers? No. So we have, I think the illiteracy rate is 42%. Okay. So it's shocking. It's it's really devastating. Um, and only a million people out of a population of about 52 million buy books. Um, please, wow. you know, like these are not absolute facts. I'm like remem remembering yeah, stats. Yeah, it's yeah. not, you know. Don't quote me. Um, but yeah, and and if you're lucky, you get ten rand a book, so you might earn like twenty thousand rand for a book, which is you know a thousand pounds. And even converted into rand, such is not enough money to live on yeah. at all, especially for a project which takes you a year. Um, there's also you know a lot of people. I've had people say to my face, "Oh, you're not like other South African writers. I would never read South African fiction, but I read you." And I'm like, "What the hell are you saying?" Yeah. It's, so is that, I yeah, mean. It I mean, is there a type of fiction that tend, people tend to write in South Africa? Is it like a kind of local? I think what, what does really well is true crime uh, okay. and nonfiction, mainly about corruption and like government scandals. Um, although my favorite South African literary scene story is that there was a mining magnate called Brett Kebble who tried to whitewash his reputation. He was very corrupt. And he tried to whitewash, whitewash his reputation by first starting an art award with a million rand prize. And he ran that for a couple of years, but it didn't work. And everyone knew, you know, the artists were like, I really don't want to be part of this. I know what I'm complicit in, but also it's a million rand. It could change <laughs> yeah. my whole career. Um, and eventually he realized this wasn't going to cut it and he was going to go down uh, for like, you know, years and years and years. And he organized his own assassination. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, and it was Mikey the Killer. And I can't remember the other guy's names. And they got Mikey him down the, the side of the road. Yeah. Nice. And uh, an, amaz uh, an amazing <laughs> investigative journalist called Mandy Wiener wrote a book called Killing Kebble. And at the Cape Town launch, Mikey the Killer, who was out on parole for having worked with the police and one of his colleagues, came to the book launch and they were also doing signings. Um, <laughs> Wait, sorry, was I'm just... <laughs> so did he actually, Was he actually, did he, did he, was, is, he, is he dead? Is he now dead? He's dead. No, Wait, he, he so was yeah. Murdered. <laughs> He was murdered on the side of the road, and Mikey the killer and one of his compatriots like turned state's witness on the other two guys, and they cooperated with the police, so they got off, um, and they came to the book signing and signed some books. Wow! And that is the most Ooh. South African like literature <laughs> story I have. So, so, so he whitewashed himself by because he's like, well, a bad person would never be killed. Is that is that is that his argument? Uh, I I don't I can't remember the exact specifics. I didn't end up. That is incredible. <laughs> I also yeah. love the guy called Mikey the killer. I mean, like not even. I, know. I mean, not even trying to hide the fact of what he does. <laughs> Non-literary <laughs> determinism there. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, the guy, poor guy, no, no choice. Got a name like that. It's just bloody uh, parents. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so I think Brett Campbell was going to go down like for major crime and would probably be put away for like you know. Yeah, I see. So he was like, I'd rather so get shot. He was trying. He'd rather. I'd rather die than my family gets insurance. Yeah. Um, that is but, insane. It, I know. It, so so anyway, so that that kind of fiction does very not that kind of nonfiction does very well in South Africa. We're like you know okay. nonfiction about the arms deal uh, and how you know being corrupted by that, uh, but also sports memoirs. And then fiction does really badly. And you know we're still competing with the Dan Browns and you know the Fifty Shades and everything else. Um, so often some bookstores actually shelve all the South African writing together. Um, and and so it just leads it just kind of adds to the stigma you know of like oh well that's south african fiction it's not it's the same with like genre fiction and like literary fiction and it's like yeah, oh it's yeah. genre oh it's like south african it's not it's not good enough um, it, to be shelved on the mainstream 
it's interesting because we've also spoken to um, some Australian authors that mm. we've had on the podcast as well, and that scene also seems to have been not not as not as um, small as the South African one. It sounds like, but mm. certainly it was. It seemed like it was quite a insular scene, if you like. There wasn't yeah. a lot of Australian writers getting exported out of Australia until. Uh, quite recently, there's there's been sort of the the sort of great crime writers like Chris Hammer and and, and um, so on that that have sort of expanded that to a more international audience. And mm-hmm. is are South African writers now getting more well known outside the country as well? Then I think so. You know, I, I hope that we we are like a South African crime writing does pretty well. Um, but I think it's also. Unlike Scandi crime writing, I think maybe Western audiences find it a little bit more uncomfortable because obviously we're going to deal with much more race-related issues and mm-hmm. social issues around around apartheid and like the legacy of apartheid. Whereas Scandi crime, it's like just a nice, you know, like you don't have to feel morally complex about like the political mm-hmm. ramifications of stuff. It's like a white white people doing terrible white things yeah. to white, you know, other white people. Um, so. And and yeah, like as I said, like there are people like Mahali Mashiko, who's another amazing like genre writer. She's written an incredible book, short story. She's done some Marvel comics. Um, she's also uh, working on a video game at the moment. You know, so I feel like we are breaking out slowly, and I think there is more recognition and there is more appetite for it. Um, I'm also thinking about like Nigerian American authors like uh, Nnedi Okorafor, um, Walid Tolabe, who's just Nigerian, Nigerian, who's got an amazing uh, book out, which is kind of an African art heist of a sacred object by a minor god a succubi with alistair crowley as their sidekick and it's just hella fun it's like this great heist it's called shigadi by wale talabe um and then of course rose thompson uh, not rose thompson tade thompson wrote Mm -hmm. rosewater uh and he's a british nigerian writer who and he won the arthur clark award and rosewater is just this incredibly strange incredibly specifically nigerian novel Mm -hmm. um which just feels so very rooted in like the culture and um and, and really fascinating. So I'm hoping that there's more space for books like that. Yeah, I mean, Definitely. I saw that you'd um, you'd done a panel recently on, on on African futurism, and I wondered, you know, this is something which certainly I've sort of on the outside could not have done any reading of it, etc. But I've seen this kind of genre of itself almost coming up, and obviously the the obvious ones, Black Panther, but that kind of a story set in Africa where it's not really focused on the poverty. It's more making mm-hmm. it a kind of high tech, futuristic, super advanced, totally different vibe than what you would perhaps normally think of as a kind of African set story. And, you know, is this quite, is this quite an interesting new sub genre or has it been around for ages and where is it going? I think it's been on for ages and also like writers living in Africa, you know, in the vast continent of Africa and one of the many different countries, uh, have been writing those stories for ages it's just we haven't been recognized and it took something like black panther to like kind of really bust out um but black panther you know unlike district nine and district nine is problematic uh, especially around depictions of nigerian people mm-hmm. um but black panther is uh it is afrofuturist and nedia who is a nigerian american writer says that there's a difference between afrofuturism and African futurism. Okay. And Mahali Mashiko also has a really beautiful essay about this, that Afrofuturism is not for Africans living in Africa, because it is this idea of this magical place. And I completely understand where that's coming from, especially if you've been ripped away from your culture and your community and enslaved and taken across the ocean and kept separate from people that you would create this kind of mythical homeland mm-hmm. um, and pour all your heart, hopes and dreams of like what that might be into it. But we have cities. You know, like Great Wakanda, it's wonderful that you're this great shining city with skyscrapers and a monorail, but you know what? We have that. Um, and it's just Af- African futurism and and writers who are writing from the continent or who have lived in, you know, lived there mm-hmm. just have a very different understanding, you know, and, and the kind of social issues and the kind of stories that we want to tell. Um, there's a wonderful new Disney Plus project called Kizazimoto, and they worked together with 10 uh, African directors from Zimbabwe, from um, Nigeria, from Kenya, South Africa, uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting some other kind of Egypt, um, to create these original stories, which were, they were coming from Africa about Africa, as opposed to Black Panther, which is coming from America about Africa. Okay. Um, and I think that's really important, as I think, you know, the same way the Own Voices campaign has been so 
monumental in like people, you know, if you're, it should be queer people telling queer stories. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that is also that we need Africans telling African stories. And I think that'll be a very, very different perspective. And of course, there will still be social issues. I think we're maybe more attuned to social issues because we've had to like live through them so in such a very raw way. Um, but I think there's also a space for like, you know, like just really fun and ridiculous and over the top and exciting and ways of kind of exploring who we are. Mm-hmm. Definitely. That's really interesting. And um, I wanted to ask you about it's something we've asked a few guests about recently with you mentioned it earlier the the sort of the impact of ai on writing um i'm so angry <laughs> yeah well <laughs> uh, i mean we've seen obviously the 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 the, the massive rise of this of chat gpt and, and other sort of llm models um but also now there seems to be springing up certain products that, that that claim to be helping people to write and things like that things like uh, um so this nice. stuff like pseudo write and prose craft was that another one mm, prose craft is a big drama this yeah, week yeah, well, that's this clo- week, yeah. that closed down now that yeah i think it's, shut the, down it's already been shut apology. down but yeah, yeah. except but, he's still selling the software which is apparently trained on oh, oh right okay, okay there you go yeah. so i mean you know obviously the the main issue for 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 anyone that's that's written something is that these engines are just reading it and then regurgitating essentially yeah. what's already there. I mean, what 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 is your views on it, and what do you think the 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 way forward is with it, given that it is out there these sorts of things already? I think we need hardcore laws in place as soon as possible. I think the studios need to work with the writers' guild and actually address these things really seriously. I work in a shared studio space in uh, Dalston in East London. And, um, you know, a lot of the other people here are animators and illustrators and designers. And we've been talking about it for months. So like my work has dried up and it's because people are using, you know, not the writing software, obviously, but like the the illustration and design software. Um, I think for me, there are a couple of things. One is that the writing is incredibly mediocre. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was teaching journalism at the University of Cape Town, I could help the good students and I could help the bad students. But there were some people where the sentence was fine. It was perfectly fine. And it was so dead on the page. And I, I just didn't even know how to like help them with it. Um, and ChatGPT feels like that. I just feel like it's just this dead, horrible thing. Um, and and it, uses, it tries to use emotive language, but it's so cliche and broken um yeah so you know on a personal level i just find it offensively mediocre um but it also you know i came up as a journalist and the kinds of way i was able to pay my rent was i did articles that would 100 percent be written by by ai today and ai is definitely a misnomer i hate i hate that way we talk about it um because, you know, I, I would I would get to do really cool investigative journalism stories. So I would get to do things like um, go and hang out in the informal settlements and talk to people about food for Colors magazine. And we do kind of really cool investigative stories. Or I'd spend two weeks hanging out with sex workers from like various different strata within Cape Town from people working on the street who were like unhoused through to people working at the very high end brothels and kind of get their perspectives and their stories. But that didn't pay my rent. What paid my rent was writing the the story on best small conference venues in the Western Cape for business magazine, <laughs> you know, and and that is how I lived, and that I that is how I was able to pursue a career yeah. in writing and be able to learn how to write and be able to do these other stories, which taught me investigative skills, it taught me voice, it taught me dialogue, um, and now young people coming up are not going to have those jobs. Um, I think it's like goldsmiths, you know, I think there aren't any working class artists in the UK anymore, or like there's a real dearth of them. Mm-hmm. And that's because if you want a full time career in the arts, it's already very difficult to make a living. And it's just going to make it worse. Uh, AI generated stories are flooding Amazon's self published department, and just drowning out everything else. Um, Clark's World magazine had to shut their submissions, it's a science fiction magazine, because they were just getting AI yeah. stories like being submitted. Um, I think two other magazines have had to shutter, not just because of AI, but also because um, of Amazon's Kindle subscription model, which is also a whole other disaster. Um, but like there's less opportunity, there's more competition, but there's more competition from Drek. Yeah. And I think the big problem is that a lot of audiences don't care. And I think especially if we're looking at screenwriting, you know, a Marvel movie is really formulaic. A Hallmark movie is very formulaic. Like, 
you know, here's the three act structure. Can you hit these beats? And then you hire a writer to come in and pump it up. And I just, I just don't think audiences will care for all the successions and the squid games and the better cool souls and Bojack Horseman's in the world. I don't think those shows are going to have the opportunity to become as big as they were. I mean, The Wire apparently only became big on season four. Breaking Bad only became big on season yeah. four. Mm-hmm. And right now the network's are like, oh, it's not getting the numbers. I'm shutting it down like season one. We're done. Yeah, it's, so it's, there's, yeah, we're it's losing that opportunity. I mean, and I think like, a lot of people, sorry, I think a lot of people are using TV as a background noise, you know, like they're cooking and they're like watching old episodes of Friends and Friends, yeah. it's not my thing, but it's fine. At least it had writers, but I think it's just going to become just really much more generic and banal and dead. Yeah. yeah we were chatting true. to um, Steve Robert Cargill um, on this kind of topic a few months ago and he, and, and he had this very similar view, which was the worry he had from the AI put in its perspective was you, you get paid a different rate for a, for writing a script and then redrafting a script and then if you get ai to write the script and then you get hired to redraft it you get paid the lower fee and, and it's exactly like, well, what's the it's, it's oh yeah so it's uh and you also see, don't you also don't own the ip you know yeah. yes um, yeah yeah and, and i think that's so many stuff formulaic enough now that you can especially i mean marvel's a, exa- a great example of some which has become very same to the point of it's it's already, I mean, it's people are starting to turn off, I think, because it is just the same thing every time, and that kind of a little bit of a few jokes, etc. The same kind of three act structure. You could, probably could get any ads, right? It's a very competent Marvel type movie, absolutely. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And I think maybe if not now, then in six months' time or a year's time, mm-hmm. you know, I think it's a uh, National Geographic just fired their entire editorial yeah, stuff, that. Is you that know, right? it's, just, it's yeah, and yeah. they're going to be like, you work with freelance editors, um. It's it's really scary, and I think we're losing. I, th- I think what AI doesn't have is doesn't have a voice and doesn't have a perspective. And I've talked about this previously, you know, with um, you know, with everything when everything everywhere all at once came out, it was it's perfect mother daughter multiverse story, and it came out as I was going to the final edits, and I was like, oh my god. And when RX and Craig came out, I was writing my first novel, Moxie Land, and it nearly put me off writing. I was like, well, what's the point? She's already done it. But mm-hmm. what I had to offer that is different to those other things is my own personal voice. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we need to value that. We need people need to be able to make a living. People need to be able to like, you know, there are very few writers who are fabulously wealthy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm lucky in that I am able to like make a full time living. Um, but it's it's just wild, and, and especially especially after lockdown, and, and and we were all surviving on content and like books and like audiobooks and 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 TV. For that now to be oh well, what's the point of that? It's, I mean, it's, I mean. It's not really surprising seeing we devalue our medical staff and our nurse and our essential workers as well. Like, you know, as soon as it's not convenient, of course, we're going to toss that aside. Yeah. Um, but I do think, I think art and storytelling is, it's it's so important to being human and understanding who we are. Um, and also, and also sometimes the relief from being a human, because you can just fall into somebody else's story and not have to deal with your own life. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I don't know, I, I, I still... <laughs> it's perhaps naive hope but i still hope because you see as you say that that, that what it can output is so incredibly mediocre that um i would hope that that there is some i I know what you mean about the general public not maybe caring that much but if they're constantly given what is pretty much drivel then hopefully they would start to want something more original but who knows who knows i mean Um, i mean we might get to the point now right where you go up to chat gbt or a similar service and you say right i want a, I want a new book and you say give me a book about spies set in the 50s with me as the main character and you know a train chase at the end well they'll do and that it, with a film as well probably. or a film yeah, yeah exactly they'll put it together but me and brad pitt on a train having a fight yeah you know, make it for you and you get to what everyone watches their own personally curated content you know it's a yeah you know Pretty, pretty they could cool. also they could also scan your face in so you could actually be in the movie. You I know? mean so that's like... quite cool. I I do like the idea of me being <laughs> fighting Brad Pitt in a train. I'll be honest, I, that part of it. Quite sure. like, but you know the voider picture, I get it. Yeah, yeah. But, you know. I think my problem is that the I think we're going to see the same thing as it's happened in fashion with like fast fashion, for example, mm-hmm. and the shadification. Yeah. You know, people don't care that like their cheap clothes are being made in the most horrendous conditions, and that people are being starved out of the livelihood, and that it's affecting other people's ability to like make and sell clothes that where they're paying their you know people responsibly um or they're caring about the environmental impact like people don't care they they just like new fashion item um and and it's disposable and that's perfect because then they can buy the next week's hot new fashion item next week 
And I think my my great fear is that books written by humans and art made by humans will go the way of a bespoke tailor. Mm-hmm. You know, and I don't know mm-hmm. about you guys, but I don't own a bespoke suit. No. I just don't. No, no. I also I also don't buy Sheen. So you know, but uh. <laughs> no, I know, I know. Well. I do, yeah, I'm not sure where we leave this other than being very, very depressed <laughs> about what's going to happen. Should we all just pee to be assassinated? Just <laughs> yeah, yeah no, perfect, totally. I'll, yeah. See. I'll, I'll see if I can get hold of Mikey the killer. That would be great. Yeah, <laughs> call, call up Mikey. Um, uh, let's let's try and end on a slightly more positive note. So um, Bridge is uh, coming out very, very soon as as we record this episode. Um, but what is next in the in the pipeline? Uh, I have an original horror TV show that I'm writing with two of my best friends, uh, Dale Halverson and Sam Beck Bessinger. It's called This Book Will Find You. It's currently on hold because of the writer's guild strike. So I hope the studios come to the table and like actually negotiate and give people the very basic minimums that they're asking for. Um, Nice. What, and what then I'm. Of, what's it about? What's the? Are you are you able to see what it's about, or is it? I I don't I don't want to tell you what it's oh, about, but um uh, yeah, it's um it's a kind of a supernatural horror about a relationship um and something. Yeah, and a and a haunted book which appears oh, and nice. causes all kinds of strife. Um, cool. Yeah, I, it's I, I'm pretty excited about it. And then I started thinking about my new novel, um, but I can't tell you anything about that either. I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry. It's, it's 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 in the very nascent phases. It's like a tiny little seedling, and it's just fragile enough that if I talk about it too much, I might kill it. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. <laughs> As you know, at the end of every podcast, we like to ask our guests the same questions. The first of which is, what was the last book that you read? Um, my friend Sam Beck Bessinger and Dale Halverson's novel, uh, Girls of Little Hope. It's about, uh, it's kind of a supernatural 90s riot girl kind of horror in a small town in Colorado. And three girls go into the woods and only two come back. And there's some very dark things happen. It's about the horror of being a teenage girl, but it's also about, um, it's also about the power of friendship, which I really, cool. which I really like. Yeah. Um, and what about the last film that you watched? Um, oh, I watched uh, Talk to Me. It's an A24 oh, horror. It's good, Australian. I'm really excited for that. Yeah. I I thought it, you know it's it's not it's not Midsummer, but it was it was really scary. Um, I thought it was really smart and like it was really entertaining. I loved it. It was great. Awesome. Cool. Uh, and what TV show you, have you been watching recently? Um, I recently, now that since I moved to the UK, I finally got to watch Search Party. It's on BBC. Oh, yeah, I don't think, yeah. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people have heard of it, but they haven't actually watched it. And it's just, it's with Aaliyah Shawcat from Arrested Development. And it starts yeah. with, uh, she's, she's a jerk. All her friends are jerks. You have to get through the first couple of episodes because they've just, they become lovable jerks, but it takes an episode <laughs> or two. Um, and she becomes obsessed with this, uh, girl from her high school who's gone missing and what I love about being able to like finally like watch the entire series is it's five seasons and the first season it's kind of in shallow grave territory it's kind of yeah. like a dark comedy um and then the second season things go wonky and like really bad and like and, and things become like worse and by the third season it's even stranger and by the fifth season it's basically the apocalypse <laughs> and but you can see that it's such great character building because I'm like, of course she would have done it. I can see how you've built this character arc across these seasons. And it's just got more and more and more batshit in the most perfect way. And the screenwriters are having so much fun with it. Um, and of course, it's completely incredible by the time you get to the end. But it's still kind of credible because you're like, yes, of course she would do that. Of course she would get herself into the situation. Um, it's great. I really love it. It's that very dark comedy. Really okay. Yeah. I like that. That's cool. thanks very much to lauren for coming on and uh, that's the, she's the second guest in in the past few weeks to recommend search party so i know i know yeah. i need to give that a watch yeah i need to need to search that one out I, on iplayer add it on the end of my embarrassingly long list of tv shows which i will eventually get to one day yes exactly exactly um but yeah i thought it was a really interesting chat obviously covering quite a lot of topics there I, I particularly enjoyed the story about mikey the killer <laughs> that, becoming a celebrity just... for killing a man that had head round. yeah i know it was yeah. a bizarre so the story. guy actually put a hit on himself and he's now dead like yeah. i've just it's just it's like a coen, coen, coen brothers it is movie. sort of you yeah, know yeah, it's it like would, a kind of fargo that kind of farce yeah black comedy almost. it's just uh 
it's bizarre yeah yeah That's very bizarre. strange but um yeah you can you can pick up bridge uh, now so we recommend you go and do that and thanks again to lauren for coming on to the podcast and as we said to her um off the recording we always love to have her back on the podcast because she's always good fun um and next week we've got another great guest yeah, next week we're chatting with the wonderful Mark Edwards, who uh, has written, oh, I mean, a book a year since 2011, I think, pretty much. Uh, more than a couple of years, he's done two books. And he's he's a Amazon uh, Thomas and Mercer writer, so kind of e-book focus, and, and a really interesting way into the genre through the kind of Kindle Unlimited, the Kindle store, self-publishing stuff. Uh, four million and, and copies I'm, sold. Four million, I mean, he's huge. Yep. He's huge, and um, and and he really it took him a while to to get in there, and it was a lot of setbacks. Um, a, a very interesting journey, in I think. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, we we highly recommend tuning in for that one. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please do take the time to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app, as that c- helps us to continue to get great guests on the podcast. And if you want to get in touch, you can always reach us by our email address, which is podcast at rightgear.co.uk. Or send us a social media message of any kind. We're on all of them. Uh, and you can get in touch with us by searching for at UK page one, except for uh, Mastodon, which is, uh, hang on, I've got it here, writing.exchange forward slash at page one pod. Does anyone and there's use one more Mastodon? which I'm missing. No, I don't think so. <laughs> we do have... We have a lot of followers at Mastodon, to be fair. I'm looking at it just now, but... Yeah, I know, but it, yeah. it doesn't... Who knows? It, unfortunately, it does seem like Twitter is still... The, or X, I know, sorry. X, X, sorry, it, yeah. It's yeah. Still, it's still the main place people go. I, I'm I'm a fan of Blue Sky. Blue Sky is the one that everyone keeps... I think, I, I think until X completely implodes and is physically unable to be accessed, it'll probably people need that kind of force, don't they? Exactly. It's, I'm I'm lazy. I, I can't be setting up any other social media. No, no, I, neither can I really. <laughs> um, it's enough managing twenty, <laughs> twelve. <laughs> yeah. UK UK page one. Um, but yeah, thanks for tuning in this week, and we will be back next week. So have a great week. See you later. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below. Hit that thumbs up button. And be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UKPage1, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.